So uh, today I'm giving a talk. It's about um, it's about search, uh, and I thought this would be a fun talk to give in part because I think it's a very sort of general interest kind of topic. Uh, it's not uh, a paper where we've been able to say as much as we'd like. So any input or suggestions on how to go further would be much appreciated. Um, but I think it does speak to something that a lot of people are interested in. So our goal in this paper is to provide an, an empirically tractable framework for modeling consumer search with learning. And so I thought I'd start off with an idea by talking a little bit about what search is, or at least what search means to economists. So I made up this definition yesterday, so it's not official, but I guess now I'm old enough that I'm allowed to make up my own definitions, and maybe they, maybe they mean something. So um, search, I'm going to say, is costly information or, or opportunity acquisition with the goal of solving a decision problem. So when economists talk about search, they typically have a particular problem that a, a consumer or an agent is trying to solve, like to try and buy something or find a job um, or find a house or find a mate, right? Something quite precisely defined. And so search then is the process by which one acquires uh, opportunities or information that will allow them to solve that problem. Um, the, the sort of the... The standard model, and we'll get to this a bit later, but the standard model that you should have in mind is I'm trying to find a, um, a camera, for example, and that's the thing we're going to study in this paper. And I might go and look at many different cameras and consider them, uh, find one that appears to be a, an attractive option, and then buy it. OK, why study search? Well, uh, we're at Microsoft. And, uh, and you know a lot of people nowadays spend a lot of time searching for things. Um, and I came across this, across this quote by Herbert Simon, um, who's, uh, I think, notable for winning both the Turing Award and the Nobel Prize, which is kind of amazing. Um, and he made this, this comment that uh, in the 1970s, that if, when you're in an information-rich world, it means that people are going to spend a lot of time acquiring information, and in, in turn, it's going to lead to a dearth of attention. Right? And this seems both very relevant today, and it also speaks to why it's so, why people spend so much time searching nowadays. We have this abundant resource, huge amounts of information, and so it's natural that we would spend a lot of time consuming information in order to make better decisions. We have, we have something we didn't have before, and we're going to place a lot of demands on it. It also speaks to a lot of the problems that people worry about in modern society, right? That people are, are uh, inattentive to important things because they're attentive to what's right in front of them. Um, so one thing I wanted to, so that's one reason to study search. People are doing this a lot. We should understand it. We should model it. Another reason I understand search is to think a little bit about um, the role of platforms like uh, the properties owned by Microsoft or by Google or by Facebook or uh, by Expedia, which is the, the paper I'm looking at here or the paper I'm showing you something from here, um, in terms of how they moderate where consumers uh, spend their time and also what they choose to consume. So this is from a paper I like um, by Raluca Ursu, who's an, econ an economist. She's in the marketing department at NYU, um, studying uh, at ex uh, a data set from Expedia uh, that got posted on Kaggle. And in this data set from Expedia, they randomized the rankings uh, of, of how the options that people could buy, so the hotels that people could consume, um, were displayed on the page. And then they also had another holdout data set, which kept them in their original ranking order uh, from Expedia. And what she shows in this uh, figure is the click-through rate declines sort of monotonically as a function of the position you were shown, your ad was shown, or your, your hotel was shown. And that's not surprising. We have the same thing in ads on Bing. There are many, many papers out there documenting this. There are many, many models of how that can happen. So it's, it's pretty clear that putting, uh, putting things at the top of the search results gets them clicked more often, gets them more attention, gets them consumed more often. What, what is a little less clear is how, how strong this effect is. So what the second uh, thing I wanted to show you from her paper is that it matters a lot what the platform is actually doing. So here she shows you conditional on being clicked. So if you were clicked, what's the probability of being purchased? And she shows that for Expedia's original ranking, uh, if you got clicked uh, and you were the top ranked thing, you were often bought 95% of the time you were consumed. Um, on the other hand, when she does the random ranking, she finds that uh, it doesn't really matter too much what position you had. 
whether you actually get consumed. That is to say, if I put something random at the top of the list, you're probably going to click on it. But you're not necessarily going to buy it, because it's not really what you wanted. Expedia has a pretty good idea of what you wanted, and therefore when you click it, you're probably going to buy it. But something random wouldn't do the trick. And so this is going to be part of what I'm trying to get at with this uh, you can lead a horse to water uh, title in the paper, is that platforms are going to have a lot of control over what people see and therefore what they're likely to originally click on, but they're not actually going to make the decision for the consumer. The consumer is going to acquire the information and then ask, is this really a good option for me? If it's not, they're going to go back and search again. And so part of what we're interested in in this paper is trying to understand how to model search, but then also to think a little bit about how much control platforms have um, over what people eventually consume. Okay, so what I thought I'd do for the beginning of the talk at least is to lead you through some of the classic search models and then try to tell you how ours differ. I'll go through some examples and then I'll give you some empirical evidence um, on, on the model that we eventually ended up on. So the classic models of search and economics uh, come from decision theory and they're earn models. So what are the characteristics of these models? You have search opportunities and to a consumer or to a user they all look identical. So it's like sticking your hand into an urn. There's a bunch of balls in there. You don't really know what, they, what they're going to be like. You can't look at them in advance. And you pull it out and you go, aha, I have found a very good price. right? Um, and this turns out to be a, a pretty poor description of many search environments. So let me first tell you what the model is so you know what the, what the results are for that model. And then I'll tell you why it doesn't work so well. So the formal model, going back to, say, uh, McCall 1970 or Rothschild 74, is that you have consumers or agents who get payoffs, UI, when they draw out of this uh, urn, that are distributed from some distribution F. They can keep drawing from the urn as many times as they like, so they have as many samples as they like, but every sample costs them some cost C. And in that kind of model, the solution is a stopping rule. You're going to stop whenever you get some UI that's greater than U bar. So whenever you get a UI that's good enough, you're going to say, great, I'm going to stop. Um, Herb Simon used this word satisficing. I think what he meant it, he meant people who are not entirely rational, but here it's a completely rational solution to satisfy in the sense. When you get a UI that's above U bar, you stop. And that's the rational thing to do because it's costly to set drawing walls from an urn, so you should, you should stop at some point. Okay. So what's wrong with that model? Well, um, in some situations, this actually would be the right model. But for a lot of online search, it's not a great model. And the reason is that the search process itself has a lot of information embedded into it. Right? So I'm showing you here a screenshot from Airbnb. I looked for um, homes in Cambridge. And if I were looking to, to rent something, um, I could consider these options. And, or I could look at the map over there. And it's pretty clear there's a huge amount of information already on the search page. Before I've even gone further and clicked through and tried to acquire additional information, already I have a lot of information at my disposal. I know something about prices. I know something about stars. I know something about locations. And in many situations, uh, it's the case that I know something before I go in depth. So the search, pro pro uh, the search process involves me knowing something initially and then trying to acquire additional information. But the options are distinguished before I even start searching. I thought the same about uh, we have to send our kid to, uh, to kindergarten, not, not soon, but in a little while. And you know, I have some vague idea about the schools and Medford versus Somerville versus Cambridge. I don't know a lot. I'd like to investigate more. But ex ante, I know something. I'm not going to start off in the dark. OK, it turns out there's a model for that, too. Um, so let me lead you through a, a second model, um, which actually a bunch of people in the lab have looked at, um, called this Pandora's box model. This is a model due to Marty Weitzman, who's at Harvard uh, in 1979. So here we have a model where there are a finite set of options. So now there are a set of elementary schools that I can consider, but there are a finite set of them. Every one of them can be different. So every single box could have its own payoff distribution. Uh, FI. So I, I look at the boxes and I know this is a box that's going to give me this kind of set of payoffs. That box is going to give me that set of payoffs. Every single box can have its own separate cost to open. So there can be a CI. Um, but the key assumption here is that the payoffs are IID across boxes. So if I open box one and I discover, for example, that this particular school in Medford that I thought had some kind of payoff distribution, maybe I have a prior. Uh, I don't know what my prior about schools in Medford would be, that they're going to be pretty good. They're going to be concentrated and pay off around, sort of pretty good. Uh, if I open it and I discover that it's actually not so great, 
I don't update on any of the other boxes. I just learned something about that one box, and I, I keep all the other boxes payoffs the same. Okay, how does this model get solved? So this model already, by the way, is much less known than the previous model. The previous model, I think, I, I saw lots of nodding of heads when I, when I put it up. This is already a much less well-known model, um, but it's very useful because it now describes a situation in which things are distinguishable in advance. Because you can say that fi depends on the characteristics of the box. So Medford schools are all going to have the same distribution fi. Some of all schools are all going to have another distribution. Right? So the solution to this problem is that you score the boxes. How do you score the boxes? Uh, you give each box a score which is equal to the current payoff that would make you indifferent between sampling that box and then stopping uh, with that payoff. So let me say that a little bit slower. I, I'm going to take a box. My, the thought experiment I'm going to consider is I could either stop now or I could sample that box and then stop. The question I ask myself is what payoff would I need to be currently holding so that I would be indifferent between just taking what I got right now or moving on and sampling that box. So if you think about one of the, the nice, the sort of the, the logic of this is a box that, for example, gives you a very, very, very uh, high, prob high payoff with tiny, tiny, tiny chance is going to get a pretty good score under this rule. Because the, cons the, consider the thing you're considering is, uh, let's say there's a box that gives you a payoff of a million with a probability like one in a million. It's tiny. The cost of spending a little bit of extra time to go and open that one tiny low probability box is not very high, so the cost is like one. And so you'd need a pretty high payoff right now to convince yourself not to stop. Right? Why, not, why not try this one box? Okay, so it gets the idea of option value very well. Um, so that's the solution to this problem. You score the boxes, and then you open them from the top score to the bottom, and you stop if the current payoff ever exceeds the next score. And you can see why this algorithm makes sense. The first part of it sort of makes sense. You've given things scores, so why not go from the top to the bottom in terms of scores? The stopping rule also makes sense. Uh, the scores were constructed so that you would be indifferent between stopping with that payoff and opening the box. If you ever had a payoff that was better than that score, you'd say, oh, I don't want to open it. I've already got a payoff that's good enough that's not worth opening the box. Okay. So this is Whiteson's model. I um, mean, it has, it has some nice properties, and Bobby and Glenn have some nice results about how you think about this in an auction context. Um, but there's a problem. So let's suppose I go and do this, and then I open up one of these, and I discover, as I did when I clicked through a few of these, that some of them are kind of basically next to uh, a railroad track. So the view is kind of terrible. Well, how should I update? It seems like I should update. One of the things I should update on is I don't really want to rent anyone, any of the properties nearby there. They're all going to have this terrible view that I don't really want. Okay? Um, or if I go to a particular school and I discover I don't like the, the teachers there, I might be worried that I don't like teachers at similar schools. I don't like the learning philosophy. Maybe it's the whole district that has a bad learning philosophy. Okay, so now I'd like to incorporate learning to this model. So what is learning? So learning is updating beliefs um, about other options based on past samples. So I've sampled things in the past, and I now have new beliefs about what's coming up next. So this seems natural. How should you update? I put this on a, a slide. Of course, the answer is you should be Bayesian. What other answer could there possibly be? Uh, <laughs> um, but even when you say that, it doesn't help that much. Because it's, it's fine that you want to be Bayesian, but you, know, you have to have some model of what the correlation structure between the options is. And then you think about that for a little while, and you're like, well, where did that correlation structure come from? What, how did I know that these things were similar and I should I should update a lot based on this one experience. Well, these things were far apart. I shouldn't update. So our suggestion here is that um, we're going to think about model as being our model of learning as being spatial. So people are going to update more for close by objects um, where close by is defined by a feature space. And this should feel very familiar to sort of an ML audience. So I have a whole bunch of options, and they're in some high dimensional space. I'm going to take some lower dimensional space, and I'm going to say on that lower dimensional space. Uh, I think the correlation structure lives in that lower dimensional space. And if things are close in this low dimensional space, I'm going to say that I should update a lot. And if they're far away, I, I don't think you should update very much. OK, so that's, the, that's what we're going to be spending most of the time talking about today. But I did want to flag one other set of things that I think are important to think about when you think about online search that we're not tackling at all. In data, you'll see that people revisit options. Uh, people tab options, which is just mo most irritating data problem, but the people have many tabs open at the same time. 
And people also spend very different durations on options. So in particular, the issue of duration seems very salient. It seems, very, it seems like the model I have here, which is like the earn model, is you click on something, you learn, or you go to a school, you learn, and then you know everything you need to know. But in fact, the process is more continuous than that. You could spend a lot of time at a school or a little time at a school. You could learn a lot about it or a little about it. And in fact, when you go to data, the duration that people tend to, how long people spend at a particular website probably tells you a lot about how much information they've acquired, how much they've updated, how seriously they're considering it. All of those things are useful, and we're not going to talk about them very much. OK. So um, the contribution that we're, uh, we're shooting for today is to introduce a tractable model of spatial learning. Um, uh, we're going to try and show you that there's what this particular model introduces relative to the old models is the possibility of path dependence uh, and belief manipulation. So I can actually go and try to change what you buy by how I rank things in a way that wouldn't have been that easy to do in the previous models. And then I'm going to show you a little bit of evidence of spatial learning in the camera search data itself. Um, and then this last part is the part that takes a ton of effort, but I'm not actually sure I'll spend that much time on it, which is that we, we fit a structural model to that data. Um, yeah. Are similar? No, but I think it's a great space. question because I think it's actually like the I think it's it, it's a it's come up a, a few times uh, also in uh, the Intel project that Lewis and work, uh, working on. Like there's something kind of um, in economics we often will, especially in structural economics, will say this is how the world is constructed. So people are choosing between cameras and the things that they think about are these characteristics. Or, in our case, people are trying to learn about the relationships between different, their values for different cameras. And the, the space in which they learn, in our case, is going to be pixels and zoom. They're going to think about cameras as being related by pixels and zoom. Or I think, and I think we have price in there as well. But our model of how those things are constructed is, is something we give, we impose on the world. Whereas I think you're right that it's a really interesting question how do people form that model and how would you know if you were right and exactly oh, they're all completely different well that would be yeah right that would be super interesting right like but I, I think it's a really good question uh, do we don't have much to say about it okay so um, let me give you the motivating example I'm going to try and show you most of what's in this paper by giving you just one example so uh, there are going to be three products, A, B, C. Uh, utility, so this is your payoff, is quality minus price. Uh, price is observable. But quality is something you can only observe after clicking on the product. So notice already that this price being observable is capturing the idea that these things are not in an urn. They all look different to you. A, B, and C are distinguishable by their price. Um, and actually, in this model, the cheapest one is going to be A, then B is going to be more expensive, C is going to be the most expensive. Quality is only going to be observed after I click on the product, and I can pay C, and I can learn the quality. Quality is going to be drawn from some multivariate normal distribution. And uh, that mu greater than 1 assumption means that I think that uh, the quality increases faster than the price as my prior, which means that if I had to just pick without doing any search, I'd pick object C, the most expensive, because I think that the slope of, of quality and price is greater than 1, so that would be the best deal. Okay. OK, so now suppose that uh, the variance covariance matrix, that, that sigma there, uh, was diagonal. So they were all independent. So for some particular values, we computed uh, what would be the uh, optimal search path. So the optimal thing to do is to search C, because we know that if you're going to search only one thing, that would be the best thing. So that's where you start. And this yellow region shows you that if, if the payoff was very high, uh, you would then just stop. So if the utility from C was very high, you would just stop. If it weren't so high, so if below about 0.75 it looks like, you would then search B, which leads you in the, to this green region. You learned nothing from searching C about the other two options. So if you, C wasn't that successful, you'd say, well, my next best option is B. Okay? And then if, if that in turn was bad, if it were the case that uh, the payoff to B was very low as well, then I'd be in this blue region where I'd searched A as well, and then I'd, and then I'd pick the best of those three. Okay, so that's, that's basically how this would look under independence of the options. What happens if we add positive correlation, which would be a natural thing to assume? So that is to say that 
um, that I think that uh, all of these things are correlated. So A, B, and C have correlated payoffs. And moreover, it depends on the distance between them and price space. So if B and C are very close in price space, I think that they probably have similar payoffs and A is not so similar. So here things are quite different. Um, the first thing is that I, I search C as before, and I buy it if the payoff is very high. But now the payoff has to be much higher. It actually has to be about 0.88. Why does it have to be so high? Well, because if I got a really good experience with C, I might say to myself, you know what, I think B and A are also going to be really good. Probably worth having another search. I just updated positively. So I'm probably going to search B next. That gets me into this region here. Um, and, and then if B is sufficiently bad, I'm going to go ahead and search A as well. But on the other hand, if C were really bad, if C was a terrible start, then I'd say actually A looks like a good idea. If, if, if B, C is terrible, then actually the price quality relationship was probably not nearly as favorable as I thought. Um, and I might do better to go for the cheapest option. So now I switch all the way to C. Uh, and again, the same utility thing applies. If then A turns out to be a very bad object, I then go and search the third object, B. OK, so you can already see just from the geometry of this, this is suddenly a much more complicated problem. Right? Um, some interesting things that come out of that is you can see uh, sort of the mechanics of what's going to happen pretty quickly. Suppose I started with B. If my prior was this, A, B, C on a straight line, but I started with B and it was a terribly bad experience, notice that in this particular picture, that affects my impression, my posterior belief on C much more than it does for A. A is very far away. I get a bad experience with B. I don't really update very much on A, but I update quite a lot on C. And so suddenly, Having a bad experience with B makes me think that A is probably better than C. OK, well, so that's, that's interesting. But that then, the thing that then becomes interesting to ask is, well, can I use this to manipulate beliefs? And so that's what we show in this little um, example from, the, from the, same, the same setup. So here we're going to look at actually uh, what gets bought in different search regimes as a function of what gets shown first. So the experiment here is, suppose I could make you view something first. So I can manipulate where you started your search. And then I just let search occur. So now I've led the horse to some particular kind of water. Now I want to see what happens afterwards. Okay. So we're going to consider what happens if I start with product A, B, or C. Remember, C here is actually going to be the best product. So the picture you should have in your mind here is, the truth is that A is over here, B is down here, and C is way up there. So that's actually the truth. So you want to buy C. Um, but obviously, if you search B, you're going to have very different views of the world. Right? So here, if I start with C, I always buy C. Okay? It doesn't matter what the search costs are. I get you to buy C. If I start with A, I also always buy C, except if the search costs are very, very high. If the search costs are very, very high, then you're never going to want to search again. So you'll just stop. The interesting case is, what if I start you off with B in this environment? Well, if the search costs are very low, you buy C, uh, because you'll just search all of them. If the search costs are intermediate, though, a terrible experience with B actually gets you to buy A. OK, because what do I do? I stick B in front of you. You realize that it looks like, uh, in fact, A now looks better than C to you. You search A. And then after having searched A, you don't really update very much on C, because it's very far away, and you stop. Okay, so for intermediate search costs, I can get you to buy product A. And then for very high search costs, I can get you to uh, stop immediately and buy, and buy product B. So the interesting thing here is that I can manipulate your choice of what to buy, and the manipulation is unusual. If I wanted to get product A purchased, most of the time, my intuition would have been, I should put A in front of you first. That's the very first thing I should do. And that turns out to be right if search costs are high. If, so, if people have not very much time, then just sticking the most attractive product in front of them will get them to buy it. But for intermediate search costs, there's this remarkably subtle strategy, which is that I stick a sort of a dummy product in front of you. It's like a decoy product. It's terrible, but it looks a lot like all the other products that I don't want you to purchase. So you look at it, you say, aha, I have learned that this class of products is actually pretty bad. I should go to the other part of the space. 
and as long as the other part of the state is reasonable, you'll stay there. Okay, and so um, there's this possibility, which I wouldn't have thought of before we try to write down the formal model, that you can manipulate people in this way by essentially um, putting uh, unrepresentative examples in front of them. So that they learn the wrong lesson, and then they go and move away from it and buy something else. Okay, so that's the, uh, that's the example. I will now go and tell you a little bit about the general model, and then I'll, I'll hopefully get to a little bit of data towards the end. So our general model is going to be uh, that consumers have utility drawn uh, uh, as a, uh, a predictable part of utility plus an idiosyncratic part of utility. So there's something predictable um, over some characteristics space. Actually, let me go through this a bit slower. So there are a bunch of important things here. So the first thing is just that I'm writing down utility over some characteristic space. There's something that you can see in advance, like price, and people define their utility over price. Okay. So one way to think about this is like think about um, the market for wine, say, which is a good example of this. I don't really know what price means exactly in the case of wine, but I sort of think that higher price means higher quality. And for every individual person, their particular relation between price and payoff is unknown to them. So there's some MX function, takes price in and outputs some payoff. And people don't know in advance. They don't actually know how, how important it is to them that they buy a high-priced or a low-priced wine. They're going to be able to sample this, but every time they sample it, they're going to get some additional noise epsilon. So the function of the epsilon noise is just to kind of um, make it so that they can't learn too fast. There's going to be some additional noise. Okay. Yeah, so, the, uh, so you, you, exactly, you could subtract off the price. So the way to think about it is, um, uh, I mean, it's an interpretation question, but it, is you see price, and there's a mapping from price to utility, which includes the price itself. Um, but you're right, there's an interesting experiment. We think that what's going on in the background is there is some real quality you're going to be able to learn. If I manipulated the price, your utility would go down holding the quality fixed. Um, for the, for the search problem, it's not going to matter too much because I'm never going to be able to perform those experiments. But yeah, it, it, it's important, that distinction. So there, there are two interpretations here. One is that um, all common characteristics are, are observable. So all things um, that consumers care about are observable, but consumers don't know how to value them. They're learning. So I don't know how much I care about price you know, in terms of what it signals about quality. The second one is more consistent with the price signaling interpretation. Consumers know how to value everything, but they don't see everything they need to know. So quality is the thing they don't know yet. Price is the thing they do know already. They know that price is correlated with quality, but they don't know how much. And that's what they're learning. So, so one story is I'm learning about the mapping from observables to unobservables. Another story is I'm learning how to value observables. And they're hard to distinguish, actually, in data. OK, the function m is going to be drawn from a Gaussian process, which is Great, right? It's just fun. Um, and, uh, and consumers are going to update over time as Bayesians. Uh, the updating process uh, has the property that the mean is going to depend on the past realization. So where I'd searched in the past is going to determine my mean value. Um, but the covariance is only going to depend on what was searched. Okay, So it doesn't matter what the realizations were for determining the, the subsequent covariances, the posterior covariances. OK, and so this is an example just to show you what these sort of functions look like. I'm drawing from something that's a prior at 0, and I get all of these different interesting shapes as possible draws uh, of the truth. Okay. Okay, so what do we then know about, uh, about this problem? So let me say, what else do you need to know about this? And you also need to know that there's some cost of search. So every time I search, I'm going to pay some cost. OK, so what do we know? Um, we know that, so first of all, by the way, this is an experiment in letting um, PowerPoint pick my slide design. I don't know how I feel about it. Anyway, um, <laughs> it, just, it just did, and I was like, well, it kind of looks nice. It's also kind of random, but anyway, we'll go with it. So um, <laughs> uh, one, one piece of feedback, I guess, for the PowerPoint folks is that uh, if, you pick a, if you take one of the design suggestions, they should then make that be the top choice of design suggestions subsequently. Anyway, um, 
yeah, OK. So, um, so the dynamic search problem has a Bellman e equation characterization. So I can write this down. I can write down the dynamic program, but I can't solve it. Okay, in general, it's, it's hard to solve. Um, and so what we're going to do is do something that a lot of people think about, which is we're going to do one paired look ahead search. So this is obviously an approximation of the solution. Often with these dynamic programs, you might try to solve them by t period look ahead search for some t. And we're going to do one. We're going to do t equals one because we can get, get a closed form solution. Um, so what does that mean in practice? That means that consumers are going to think about either continuing and purchasing the best product available or, uh, sorry, so either just stopping and, and purchasing the best product available or taking one more search and then stopping. So they're only thinking one step ahead. Should I stop now or should I take an option and then stop? Okay, so that's a much simpler version of behavior. What's wrong about this kind of myopia? It's going to ignore the possibility that people make choices purely for, for information acquisition. So you could imagine it doesn't actually arise in our environment, but in general it could arise that there's some option which is nothing, something I would never choose, but would be very informative for me in terms of knowing about everything else. So something that was very central, if you think about it in space, maybe not a particularly attractive option, but central and informative about everything else. That's not going to show up in our, our case. It's also going to be the case that, uh, remember I talked to you about the Weitzman model, this idea that you might choose to sample something that has a tiny payoff, tiny probability of a very big payoff, something highly speculative. Here being highly speculative is not the, that attractive because it, it's nice to have one more search, but if I had something else in my choice set that was going to give me a guaranteed improvement and I knew I only had one more search possible, I might choose to take the guaranteed improvement rather than trying out this one speculative option and then hoping to get something in the future. Um, having said that, in our particular setting, because of the way the variances are normalized, uh, there's actually not much of this high, there are no highly speculative options, everything's Gaussian. And so it turns out under independence, this particular policy is optimal. So one period look ahead turns out to be optimal. Um, under independence and under correlation, which is what we're most interested in, it's not clear. Okay, so what does the optimal policy look like? Uh, I copied and pasted from the paper uh, because it doesn't really make that much sense to go through it. But uh, you're going to score options. You're going to give them some uh, zj, which is going to be their score. What's the score going to depend on? It's going to depend on what you're currently holding, the best option you had. It's going to depend on the mean of that option currently, the current posterior mean. And it's going to depend on the current posterior uh, variance at that point. Okay, um, and there's a very specific formula for that, and the, option, the cost of opening that particular option. Um, what can you say about this formula? Really, not a lot, except to say that things appear as you'd expect. Uh, I'm better off if things score higher if there's a higher current option, but this score is going to be compared to the current higher option, so if the current option is higher, I'm more likely to stop, because this only gets weighted with some probability uh, that's less than one and the current option gets a full weight of 1. I'm going to take a weighted average essentially between the current option, the probability I don't get anything better than the current option, and then I'll take u hat. The probability I do get something better than the current option, then I get mu plus a bonus, which depends on the variance because there's some tail, and it's a sort of truncated normal. Okay. So uh, what can you say about that? You can say that uh, consumers will opt for options with high mean and high variance. That's not surprising. And we can also show that consumers will be more likely to go for risky options when their current option is good. So if an option has a bigger left tail, has a lot of downside risk, or it's second order stochastically dominated formally, then I'm going to be more likely to take it if I'm already holding something good. Right? I'm willing to take a chance when I've already got a good option at my disposal. OK, what about what do you do next? So what happens after a, product, a consumer searches some product K? How do they adjust future behavior? That's hard because we can't characterize the full Bellman equation, so we can't tell you everything about it. Um, but we can say some things about, uh, even in the one period case, we, it's hard. Uh, but we can say some things about future behavior. So a good experience at location k is going to increase the posterior mean at places with a high covariance with k. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. That's just sort of the updating policy. I thought mistakenly that that meant that things that were close would be attractive. And that's sort of a natural intuition. So if I have a good experience, at some point in the characteristic space, I should think more positively with everything close by. That turns out to be partially true, but it's moderated by the fact that the covariance depends on how many times you've already searched in that area. 
So if I've ever spent a lot of time searching local to this point, I actually don't think I can learn anything anymore. And so it's not going to make very much difference. Um, and so actually the biggest impact could be felt on places that were further away that I just haven't explored as much. Okay, so what actually matters is going to be the covariance, which is going to depend both on space, but also on how much time you spent there. Um, and then whether this update is pivotal, so whether you actually do anything different based on this, this experience that you've had, will depend on the current best option. If you're already holding a very good option, uh, learning that some place far away is a little bit better off may not be so great if, if it's already uh, dominated by the current best option. Okay, so implications. Um, after a bad experience with a product, a consumer should either jump to somewhere uh, far away uh, or they should jump to somewhere that's known and safe, basically where they had no real update. Okay. Um, and a platform can steer consumers away from a part of the characteristic space by ranking bad products from that area higher. So if, if a platform knows considerably more about the products than the consumers do, and they want to get the consumers not to buy in a particular area, all they have to do is take the worst representative products from that area, put them at the top of the list, and wait for people to experience that and then move away. Okay, so you can, you, can, you can do quite a lot of manipulation here. Okay, so let me show you some evidence, at least on this first implication. So... Um, what we're going to do is we're going to follow a paper um, from Bronenberg, Kim, and Meller uh, in 2016 in Marketing Science uh, that documented the ways in which people tend to search online. And we're going to go through their analysis. We're going to add a bit of additional analysis to show that what, what their paper seems to be pointing to is exactly the kind of spatial learning model uh, that we want uh, you guys to pay attention to. Okay, so... Um, the, the data is from Comscore. Uh, what it is is uh, clickstream data. So it's a sequence of URLs where people clicked one after another. We see the sequence of product pages that are loaded as well as the product that's eventually purchased, uh, if it's purchased. And there are 967 panelists uh, over a period from August to December in 2010. Here are some facts about the data. The first one is the search length is about, on average, about 5.6 clicks. Um, that's quite high, and in part it reflects the fact that they're tracking people across multiple websites. So it's, it's well known that people spend a lot of time studying search, but if you look at search on a particular website, it often looks as though people didn't really search very much at all. So if you look at a particular session, it's often the case that people went to web page, bought thing, end of session. Um, and there are two data problems here. One is that you didn't see what they were doing on other websites before the hand. So if you're, if you're Amazon, you only see what they're doing on Amazon, right? Um, and two is that often they spent many, many sessions learning before they decide to pull the trigger and buy. Okay, so this has the advantage that we can track them over a, a, a four-month period and see what they were doing for the whole four months uh, in terms of camera purchasing. And we can, uh, we can show this, that this been about, about uh, conditional on buying something they spent about 5.6 clicks getting to where they wanted. The second part here is, is when in the search process they found the thing that they, that they eventually bought. And that turns out to be about 80% of the way in. So that 0.79 means that they were 79% of the way through their personal search process before they actually found the thing they were looking for. So it's not where they start. Um, it's not surprising that it's sort of towards, towards where they end. If you found something you really liked, you're probably going to stop. So it should be towards the end. Um, they tend to buy something that's cheaper than the things that they'd searched on average. So it feels like they're a little bit aspirational. They tend to sample things that are a little bit more expensive than what they end up trying to buy eventually. But otherwise, actually, in terms of the other characteristics that we track, zoom, the number of megapixels, and uh, the size of the display, um, they, they're pretty similar in terms of both search and purchasing. OK, so this paper by Bornenberg, Kim, and Mella is called Zooming In. Um, and what they want to show is, I, I think, like the, the feeling of like circling down a, a, drain, uh, a drain hole in the bath or something like that, is that people get closer and closer in characteristic space to the thing that they eventually buy. So here what they're tracking on the uh, x-axis is how far along in the search process you are. And on the y-axis is the difference between what you're currently considering and what you eventually bought. And so what they show is that the absolute deviation between 
what you were considering and what you eventually bought is monotonically declining over the search process. So it's like you're getting closer and closer in characteristic space to the thing that you eventually buy. Uh, and the same thing is also true for pixels. So it's like people start out quite wide, they kind of find an area of the space that they like, which eventually ends up being the area they buy in, and they kind of zoom towards it. Here's another way of seeing this. Uh, here they're going to look at the, uh, at the ratio of price search to price chosen and take the log of that. Um, and this is the search decile, so it's the same sort of thing. And what they're going to show you is that over time that, that range of values is getting tighter and tighter. So that, the, that ratio is getting closer and closer to, uh, to one logged zero, right? So zero. So we, we took the data set and we added some additional plots. So one of those is we looked at um, step size. Because one of the things you would think that would be going on in our model is that over time you would find a region that you like and so you just start taking smaller and smaller steps over time as you got more and more certain as to what your preferences were. There were not less and less variance. So that's uh, what we find. We find as well that the size of the steps, I think this is in log, in log I think this, yeah, this is in logs, uh, goes down over time. So as same thing, search percent on the x-axis. People start off making step sizes and logs of like 0.65, then they're down to like 0.45 by the end. Uh, and the same is true in pixels. So people are getting, uh, start off bouncing around the space because they don't really know what they're doing, and then they kind of tend to take smaller and smaller steps. And I guess this might remind you a little bit of an optimizer in some ways, right? Um, Okay, so that, none of this really directly tests our theory. It's sort of consistent with it, but we wanted to come up with something that was a, a decent test of the theory itself. We couldn't quite nail this. It's hard to come up with a, a perfect test of the theory, but here's a, certainly a suggestive test. So the theory says that a bad experience should lead you to move to another part of the characteristic space. Okay, you should try and jump far away or jump to somewhere safe, but often jump far away. So we're going to define a bad product as a product which has been viewed by at least 10 people, but only purchased by less than 5%, which is a very low rate conditional on being viewed. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to regress your step size, so how far you move away from that point, on the previous product uh, being bad. So that's going to be the dependent variable. I just saw something terrible. What do I do? Okay. Adding controls for search percentile, so how far along I am in the process. Uh, product density and consumer fixed effects. Let me, I'll talk through those on the next slide. Um, what I want to say is that compared to the models I was setting up as, the, as the, sort of the basic models, the Weitzman model or an Earn model, in those models, there's no reason for this to happen at all. Everything is independent. All the products are independent. So the only reason you should see this is in a model where the spatial, the spatial component of learning actually matters. And that's why we think it's an interesting test of the theory. Okay, so what, what happens? Um, if the product you searched at period t minus 1 is bad, then your step size increases quite a lot. So in price space, the step size is on average 170. Um, but if it, you just saw a bad product, it goes up by another 100. So it's like 270. So it's a substantial change in how far away you, you move. If I control for search percentile as well, um, then I get very similar coefficients, actually, but now the search percentile term enters with a negative ter uh, sign indicating that over time people are taking smaller and smaller step sizes. But we get the same result. We get a slightly smaller result when we add this uh, set of things we call density controls. So the one confounding story would just be if I'm already, if the bad products happen to be located in isolated islands where there's no other products nearby, then you're going to have to move far away. There's nothing you can do mechanically. You'd have to move far away. So it doesn't tell me anything about the story. It just tells me something about the location of bad products in space. So we add controls for density, and we do find that the effect gets smaller, but it's still significant. Um, and then the final thing we do is we add an individual fixed effect. So we're now at this point asking, we're controlling for how big each individual consumer's step sizes tend to be, and asking, do you still find this effect that when one of those consumers hits a bad product, they tend to move further away? And the answer remains... Uh, yes. Okay, so this we think of as being, um, you know, it's not perfect because, uh, you know, if you think about an actual experiment, I'd really want to know what a bad product is, and here I'm just defining it to be this way. Um, but uh, I think it's, it's pretty, it's pretty uh, 
suggestive that there's um, some degree of spatial learning going on. OK. So in the last 10 minutes, I can then tell you a little bit about uh, how we, um, having sort of suggested this is a, a pretty reasonable model of the world, and it's one that's consistent with this data. Um, and in fact, we can find new evidence in this data for the model. And then tell you how you could actually try and then take the model to data and actually estimate, um, estimate the model. So now we make the model a lot more complicated. So uh, we're going to have people having individual preferences over characteristics. Um, so now there's going to be mu i is going to be alpha plus x j beta i. What is this saying? It's saying that I'm allowing for the possibility now that everybody differentially values, say, the relation between price and quality. So I'm now going to allow for um, people have very different priors. Um, uh, I'm going to insist that the ways in which people are different are governed by a random coefficient structure, which is equations 8 and 9. Um, and the covariance structure uh, we're going to use is this sort of, uh, uh, sort of Gaussian exponential decay, uh, where we're going to allow the bandwidths to be different along every dimension. So it's possible that people treat a distance in price space as being very different from a distance in, di dis uh, in pixel space. And we're going to allow for that to be appropriately normalized. I think this is over-parameterized, to be honest. I think it would probably be better to standardize the variables and stick a, a single bandwidth parameter in. But we, we went very, we, we decided to be more general. Um, and then the costs are going to be sampled, uh, which is actually going to make our lives a little bit easier. So we're going to have um, uh, individual search costs. So each individual consumer is going to have a different search cost. You need that to rationalize the fact that some people search a lot and some people search a little. So you want to allow for that possibility as well. OK? Um, you write down this model. Uh, you then want to estimate on the data. We do that by um, Markov chain Monte Carlo um, on the likelihood function. OK. So um, how well does this model fit the data? So one way to, to tell how well you're doing is you, you fit the model by maximum likelihood, and then you go and just take these, these things that we saw uh, at the beginning of the, uh, well, a few slides back on the summary statistics page, and simulate a bunch of paths and ask, do we match what the data looks like in terms of these moments? And the answer is we do and we don't. So we do pretty well on search length. Uh, we can capture how long people end up searching. We can capture how long it takes during the search process. We can match how long it takes during the search process to find uh, the product. Uh, but what we don't do quite as well on, on is explaining how much search they engage in. So within a search, uh, there's a log price variance. And within a search, there's a display variance. So how, how different are the things they search? And our simulations would suggest, going through the model, that they should be doing a lot more for our parameters. Uh, there should be much more variation than, in fact, we're seeing in the data. Um, so our, our model is not really uh, able to explain why they're, why they're so tight in what they search. Um, we also are not doing so great on these two moments, which are the last two. So how, how far apart is the first search to the one that they eventually purchased in log price? We would predict that they would start further away than they actually do. And the same thing is true in display. So some features of the data you could rationalize pretty well with this model, at least with the model we fitted. Um, but it appears that people are a little bit more um, localized in where they search and almost a little bit more sure of where they're going to end up than we are, we are able to uh, predict with this model. And then the last thing we do in the paper is we try to actually uh, take that thought experiment we talked about earlier, the, the path dependence manipulation uh, thought experiment, and ask what would that look like for this particular set of calibrated parameters. So here what we do in what we have in mind is we're going to give you a very bad first experience. So we're going to take an artificially made up product, so a product that doesn't actually exist in our data, but it, I think, well, actually, I'm not sure. I think it's the worst product in our data. And we're going to make sure that you see that first. We're going to force you to see that first. And we're going to ask what happens. So um, we then calculate the change in demand. So what's the problem that you eventually get purchased over many, many simulated search paths? Uh, in terms of how close you are to that bad initial search. So what you can see is that the products that are close by are going to be hurt. They're going to have lower demand. And the products that are far away are actually going to have enhanced demand. So the demand is, for their products is going to go up as a function of uh, having, being located far away. 
And so what we can then do is, uh, is look at uh, what would counterfactually have happened in this experiment. So what is the impact of putting a really bad product first? A few things happen. The first is that search length goes up. If you have a very bad first experience, you're going to be more inclined to search more in the future because you want to find something better than where you started. The second thing is that people are going to um, also stop a lot earlier. So a lot of people, remember there are different kinds of people out there. Some people are going to search more of those than people with low search costs, but the people with high search costs are going to be very discouraged and just stop. So they won't buy anything at all. Um, primarily because of that, uh, people are going to have lower utility on average. So giving them this bad first experience is going to drive people away. Driving them away is generally going to mean that they end up being uh, less happy than before. Okay? Um, and we also then calculate, suppose that people weren't learning, suppose people were, the model actually genuinely, genuinely did have independence baked into it so people didn't have to learn. Uh, what would happen to the consumption utility? And the answer is nothing at all. So this is just a sanity check. It's saying that if people uh, didn't learn spatially, could you change their reality by sticking a very bad product in front of them? And the answer is no. Right? That bad first experience really does nothing to the subsequent purchases. So it really can only make a difference if uh, people are making inferences about the other options based on the thing they see. And if they do, then it's possible to manipulate their experience and, and, uh, and uh, make things worse for them. Okay, so that is all I have. That's, that's the paper. Um, and yeah, I'd be happy to take any questions.